the Delta variant has very visibly raised the price of stupid, right? <laughs> and because it's raised the price of stupid, of entrenched stupidity, the price of stupid has gone up as the cost of stupid and the, the stupid politics that run along with that, the endurance of the stupidity of the stupid caucus, cost of stupid has risen who rode the stupid wave. Hmm, stupid. That's the first thing Joe and Mika say to each other when they wake up. <laughs> yes, I hate them. Terrible people. Yeah. Yeah, we're all high. Everybody's yelling. Yeah. Well, it's been 20 years since 9-11, and you gotta wonder, what's it like for the person who's not 20? Do they know enough about what happened that day to produce a cogent opinion? Well, once you look at the latest campus reform student on the street interview, the answer might be, God help us. Did you learn a lot about 9-11 growing up in the classroom? Uh, not in the classroom, but on my own. I like kind of did my own little like research thing. No, I did not. Um, I'd say we learned a moderate amount. Um, I mean, they showed us like the videos, like the basics. I didn't learn super specifics about it. I had like a whole unit where it was like two months worth of learning about it, which was a little strange. Well, yeah, definitely. My family is Bengali, so we're all Muslim. So it was a very like, it's something we were very conscious of. Mm, well, that was as comforting as someone looking at their watch during a funeral. <laughs> but hey, they're young. We're all kind of silly back then. But maybe given the chance, what would they want people to learn about 9-11? When talking about 9-11, what do you think we should avoid? I think we should, like, avoid a lot of more gruesome facts. Avoid talking about its roots in Islam because that that was, a, like, an extremist group. Um, I think that um, the 9-11 attack should be taught in a way that doesn't really target, like, more, like, who did it, but, like, more like how we can like move forward and like different like healing processes that we can go through to like make everything like, you know, good again. So you don't think it's important to know who is responsible? I do think it's important to know who is responsible, for that, but I also think it should be noted that like their religion is not the only thing. Avoiding kind of placing blame because when you get to the more like specific factors that were at play, you know, it kind of opens the opportunity for things like Islamophobia and ideas of American exceptionalism. Ugh, you gross. <laughs> Look, it's unfair to say these kids are representative of a population as a whole. But what are they representative of? How about an educational system that's more about indoctrination than instruction? One that pushes anti-American bile, spewing from miserable, passive-aggressive, physically unattractive, perpetually wrong professors whose misdirected anger damage impressionable minds. Thanks to these Marxist think tanks we call universities, we have a few generations who know less about this country than I do about dunking a basketball. <laughs> and somehow, exceptionalism is easier to condemn than terrorism. There's a recent video that came out from the Virginia Department of Education that showcased an American University lecturer, and she basically said that when talking about 9-11, we should avoid talking about American exceptionalism. Would you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. We definitely should, because we don't need, we don't need more nationalism in this country. We need more, like, healthcare. I don't know. I think they should focus on America's faults, not, like, how amazing we are and how we need to be superior, because we're not. In terms of um, propagating this idea that our nation is the best no matter what, um, I would agree that that should be avoided. I don't think we should be talking about like the greatness of the country. I definitely don't agree that America is the best country on the earth. I think that we still need a lot of like fixing. I think it's a dangerous mindset to, ha to teach young people that, because I think that's the reason why a lot of people grow up to be kind of extremist and like really nationalistic. Oh, I hope stupidity is not contagious. <laughs> but why would someone their age think this country is exceptional? They got to the party late. The house is crowded. They don't know these new people who just keep strolling in. Fights are breaking out. The keg is almost empty. And the authorities are on their way to shut it down. They arrived as this once great party started winding down. And sadly, to them, something horrible perpetrated against us is just another opportunity to talk about how bad we are. So, unlike Jesse's hair, 
History is a malle malleable thing, <laughs> like that word. Who teaches it and how they teach it can determine how your kid interprets the world. And if they're too young and fearful to call BS, it's easy to be brainwashed. Just recently it worked for less cops will make us safer. So what would I tell them right now? I was in New York City when it happened. It was as surreal as it was devastating because it's the first time you felt engulfed in horror. Well, second, if you were married. <laughs> You're in the heart of evil. It's not a movie. It's not something you can't walk out of because it sucks. And you're in it, and it changes you forever. The same way a person is changed forever if they are a victim of a violent crime. You can't have these baby thoughts about silly things. You can't just shrug it off as something we deserve because we're so mean and powerful. That day was something else, and the something else is called evil. Sadly, that's forgotten as many now occupy their brains with like gender pronouns and self-obsessed grievance. But I'm pretty sure if you were on the 95th floor of a burning building and the fireman rescuing you called you the wrong pronoun, you'd let it slide. Some events in life have a way of putting things in perspective, the difference between what's important and what's trivial 9-11 was one of those events. But this 20-year conflict, for some, has been back-page news, including politicians and media. Not as interesting as Britney, Kaepernick, or Black Lives Matter. There's too much stuff to think about, and a lot of it really doesn't require thinking at all. Just feeling angry and looking important and saying what you're told to say. We've insulated the country successfully from our conflicts, but by insulating them, they now have no visceral response to this moment, this event that affects millions of people. It's so good here, people don't even know it's good. We assign false bravery to the loudest voices. Who can cry the hardest? Who can claim the most victimhood? This relates to 9-11. On that day, almost 20 years ago, we were reminded that we were Americans, not blacks, whites, gays, trans, non-binary woodland creatures. <laughs> we didn't proclaim our separate categories. We were Americans. Too bad it took 3,000 innocent souls violently snatched from us to remind us of that. That's not tribalism or nationalism. It's understanding what you share with each other, that you were attacked for being you. Fact is, in 2001, we were Americans. But in 20 years' time, we've been coerced by a profit-seeking media to reject that. You could argue these entities have done more psychological damage to this country than any outside enemy, creating a whole industry off of hating America. Because inciting wars between each other means profits for companies, power for activists, and a distraction from real evil. On the 20th anniversary of 9-11, we call people who don't want a vaccine terrorists. Fact is, as long as we are at each other's throats, who needs terrorists? Al-Qaeda did 9-11. The rest is a self-inflicted gunshot wound as a result of friendly fire. Let's welcome tonight's guest. If she had it her way, she'd be co-hosting the four. America's Newsroom co-anchor and the five co-host, Jada Burrito. There you go. He can kill a man 30 different ways, 29 of them with his leather pants. Retired Green Beret Master Sergeant and host of Hollywood Weapons on the Outdoor Channel, Jerry Shepard. She is the target market for Zoloft gummies. Fox News contributor, Kat Tim. When asked what Tyrus does for a living, his opponent said, beats me. My massive sidekick and the NWA World Television Champion, Tyrus. All right, T uh, Terry. Yes, sir. Like me, you are a hero. <laughs> <laughs> After 9/11, I, I went on you. and did some things for my country, uh, editing Maxim. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what did you do after 9-11? So, yeah, so I've been out of the, this perfect tee up. <laughs> so I've been out for four and a half years. I got out from active duty. I've been almost nine. I went to classical theater school, Circle in the Square. I was a working actor in Manhattan and we got attacked. Mm -hmm. So I thought to my, I, what do I do next? So I re-enlisted in the National Guard Green Berets and I was October 2001 and I retired in October 2016. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. And I, I remember thinking to myself, okay, we're at war, what do I do? I'm not telling people 
that that's what you have to do. That's what, this is the right decision for me. It cratered my career in one way, but also opened up other opportunities. And I remember after I got back from the first deployment after 9-11, my, my mom said to me, she goes, I haven't seen you look this happy in a long time. And I go, well, I'm around the guys I love. And so that's what I did. I, I actually am not interested. I've never been interested in hearing how people felt mm -hmm. during 9-11. I don't really care what you were doing when it happened. Mm -hmm. What did you freaking do afterwards? How did you change yourself? Did you, did you get smarter? Mm -hmm. Were you kinder? Did you stop voting for people who are working for your demise? You know, did you pay attention? And I think a lot of people, right off the bat they did, but then they sort of stopped. And I want to say something else too about the young people. We just saw a clip of really, really <laughs> not very smart mm -hmm. and soft shell crab human <laughs> beings. There's a whole other side of our country that's not that. Right. And it's the young, young, the young studs that I saw coming in that would put on their body armor and go down the road knowing they were going to get hit. These 19-year-old kids. And when we just lost the 13 recently, everybody was like, oh, they're so young. Right. Who did you think were fighting your wars? <laughs> yeah. Did you think it was Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders or even <laughs> Donald Trump? No, it's young people. Mm -hmm. It's young people doing it. And so hard times make hard men. Mm -hmm. Hard men make good times. Good times make soft men. And we are now in the stage of soft men make hard times. Mm. So that's what's coming. Mm. You know, uh, that's amazing. Um, but I think, I think the take-home message here, and the real tragedy. Here comes the insult. The, no, the, I'm going to tell you the real tragedy is that 9-11 killed Terry's acting career. <laughs> think, think of, uh, Dana, think of all the movies we oh, missed. Cool. No, without, he, he was a stage actor. <laughs> yes. I, I, I really so feel it was a mercy play. killing. <laughs> It was a mercy killing. <laughs> First of all, he's on TV I now. love you, hate you, <laughs> not a fan of you anymore, and you, I got nothing to say. You're terrible people, but Dana's the best. Shame on you, Greg. Fair. So, Dana, like, uh, like me, you're a hero. Yeah. Um, uh, what, I mean, your life changed because you ended up coming to D.C., correct? Yeah. My life, yeah. I look back on this day. It's been a lot of reflections this mm -hmm. week, and I think that the fact that we are remembering and commemorating this uh, day, this 20 years, it feels like it's a milestone. Mm -hmm. And it is something where you have some people, like I read in the paper, they're like, we just got to move on. Yeah. We don't need to have these memorials. And then I've been watching some of the documentaries that have been done, and I'm like, Look at what the people went through. Yeah. And imagine suggesting that the United States no longer needs to teach what happened at Pearl Harbor. Right. Mm. Or what happened to Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. Or what happened to JFK. Mm -hmm. Or what happened to George Floyd. Right. I mean, would anybody suggest that you shouldn't do that? But this one, this one they wanted to let go because... They don't want to think America's exceptional anymore? Or that America is a vic like America is the victim here. They don't want to hear that either because we're the bad guy. All those, other, all, right. all those other things you mentioned, you could argue is America's fault, right? Absolutely, you could. You know. And they do. Yeah. And I think that um, Condi Rice has a piece uh, in the Wall Street Journal in which she says, if we don't continue to do this, if we don't live up to never forget, we are doomed to repeat it, which is um, not as eloquent a way of saying what, he, uh, what Terry ended with, mm -hmm. because... Well, he's an actor, and so... I, <laughs> I would say that it is really interesting <laughs> to think about all those young people that we saw on, on, on the video. I could watch that all day. Yeah. Um, but you think about the young people that died outside of the Kabul airport, and, and they were signing up to serve their country in order to make sure that they could say whatever they wanted. Yeah, yeah. And I don't even, I don't, I, I don't want to bang on these, uh, these kids too much because, you know, they're walking down the street and they're not thinking yeah, about right. stuff. Like, I, all man on the street stuff is like yeah. almost kind of like, these people are not prepared. If you ask me anything on the street, <laughs> There's a 50% chance I, I'm on a, on a substance. <laughs> and whatever comes out of my mouth is going to just You'll be... You'll look dumb. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I'll be brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I'll be Sorry. brilliant. Right. Much like your acting career. <laughs> um, so, so this I is get... what's going to be on the rest of the night now. Yeah. Yes, okay. oh, you yeah. know that you, you know gave that. me the one line that I I'm going to beat to yeah. the ground. Thank you for your hey. service. You chose... <laughs> to... By the way, Gr Gutfeld, you're welcome for your freedom. Yes. <laughs> to mock me. Listen, you chose not to wear leather pants. You did this to yourself. If you had worn leather pants, I would have been much nicer. Oh, I'm sure you would have backed off. Or the off. chaps or something, but I hate all of them. Yeah. I hate all of them. You know, um, no chaps here. No, no. Yeah, marks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kat, Kat, when you, in uh, to September 11, 2001, you were 36. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, actually, you were, um, what are you, 11 or 12? I was 12. Right. Yes. So, okay, as, as a 12-year-old, mm. what was that like? 
Well, it was, as a 12 year old, I was at school. Were you a fat kid? No. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> I, thank you, though, because that would have been very re relevant to my experience of what 9 11 was like for me. Yes. Um, and it was weird because nobody would like tell us what happened. Like all, mm -hmm. nobody would tell us. We were in a school. We didn't have like TVs in, in the school or anything mm -hmm. like that. We didn't have like internet phones or what anything like that. Are you like Amish? Uh, <laughs> St. Mary's Catholic School in Mount Clemens. <laughs> okay, there you got it on. Yeah. And so I had to wait till I got home, and you know, was just watching the TV. And I, it's the first time I remember, you know, asking my parents about stuff that they didn't really have the answers to. Mm -hmm because they were just as shocked and confused as I was. Mm. Right, yeah. Mm. It was when the adults were powerless. Yep. Yeah. All right, last word, Tyrus. I'm kind of curious what, what you were doing 20 years ago, but I want to know what you're <laughs> thinking now. Well, I'm, I'm thinking that I'm glad he hates you a little more than me, so <laughs> um, that's getaway time. Yes. Uh, you know, I was in Louisville, Texas with uh, my dear friend Martin Simmons, who's not with us anymore. We were, we were just coming off of arena football, and I had just got signed my first agent, and I had a tryout oh, yeah. with the Dallas Cowboys, mm -hmm. and I was trying to figure out if it was the Cowboys, the Bills, or, and I had a, a Toronto deal, so I had all these real important things. So I, we went to the club that night, that we partied, get up in the morning, and we see the planes go in the building, and we thought it was a TV show. Mm -hmm. I kept switching the channels. Still didn't, still mm -hmm. didn't resonate, like, what just happened? Yeah. And then for me, although I didn't go into acting then, <laughs> but it was at that moment that I realized that, like, my priorities in life are completely Mm -hmm. because I'm the most important thing in the world right now, and I, because all I cared about was my sports and seeing what was going on. That's when I started getting into looking into politics and looking into things. Right. So for me, it really caused me to grow up a little more mentally and see what we could do, yeah. you know, because we were helping getting supplies down there. We wanted to go down there, but they started stopping people because so many people volunteered mm -hmm. to go to New York and dig up stuff, and we were willing to... Guys we're working and training with, we're big, strong guys. Like, hey, we can go help. And we're being stopped, but we found things to send supplies down there. Yeah. Did you want to say something, Dana? I was going to say for those for, for young people today, the one thing they didn't get to experience on 9-11 that we did was everyone coming together. Yes. And that feeling and that ability. And I think that we all kind of miss that. We long for it. And we keep thinking something's going to happen to bring us back to that moment. It should have been COVID. <laughs> it could have been. You know? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Which we're going to talk about in the next block. Still ahead, the grand finale of my epic Donald Trump interview. And up next, Biden says, uh, <laughs> Biden, <laughs> Biden, what, do you, can you read that? I don't even know what that says. <laughs> Biden says heed his vaccine order, but not if heed. you jump this. Who puts heed, who puts heed <laughs> in a tease? Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.